in the name of our ancestors, and I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming out tonight to, to be uh, with Sister Kenyaka and her family and to, to have me to come and be your guest and to be able to speak to you this evening on this very important topic, a lecture that I have been doing now for the last eight years, uh, the Egyptian Temple Mother of the Christian Church. And so it's really uh, my honor to be able to come to her home, sister, brother, to be able to do this presentation. Sometimes I think I even prefer the intimate uh, setting of the home to do this type of work because people can get a little closer and we have a chance to sit and commune and to talk with each other on a more personal level you know, versus being out in the public and doing things in the universities and so forth and so on. And so this is, this, is a very, this is a very trying lecture. I don't know how many, how many of you have seen a lecture that deals with the uh, African origins of Christianity uh, related to that subject. You know, for the first time, it's, it's bound to be somewhat <coughs> shocking uh, to see that uh, the story, the way they told us, just ain't so. You know, the way, the way they told us the thing came about it just didn't happen that way. And uh, as a young boy growing up in uh, South Central and East Los Angeles, you know, I went to church every Sunday with my grandmother. Uh, my mother passed away when I was a very young boy at the age of nine years old. And so my grandmother, who was the matriarch of our family, she was the one that saw to it that we went to church every Sunday and she picked us up and I was in Sunday school and I was in the choir and I participated in all the activities. Uh, in fact, my church was Mount Moriah Baptist Church. It's a very large church and they had uh, relationships all over the country, including in Africa. And so uh, uh, the minister then was uh, Reverend Pleasant and we were so involved in the church that uh, the, the minister's uh, daughter married uh, my first cousin, my aunt's son. And so the, the minister's family was like my own family. We'd go to their homes for dinner, and they'd come to our home for dinner. And so we were very close-knit family. And so I came up under uh, a lot of theological teachings. I had an uncle also in Stockton, California, two uncles, as a matter of fact, in Stockton, California, who were also ministers. And I used to go uh, in the summers and spend the summers with them. One was a carpenter. I even helped him to, to build churches, to construct churches. And this is where my first... Uh, uh, influence of architecture where I saw the blueprints and uh, it inspired me to go into that area to look into you know what this blueprint was all about and so with the along with the theological teachings I began to aspire to, to the field of architecture and uh, I went on and, and graduated from a few schools and, and gained a few degrees and did some traveling and one of the things I always like to say to the old folks when I was growing up they'd always say boy get you an education that's something they can never take from you and my uncle had a third grade education. My father had an eighth grade education. My grandmother had no education. They all told me, boy, get you an education. That's something they can never take from you. So I, I, I took their advice. I, I went out and went through the, the public school system, the university system, started traveling around the world. I came back home. I said, look, I got a lot of information for you now. I went out and got my education. Now I want you to hear this. And they said, boy, go on now. I ain't got time to hear that stuff. Go on. Get out of here with that black stuff. Here you come with that black stuff. I don't want to hear that stuff. Say, ain't you the same person that told me, boy, to go out and get you an education? And why did you tell me that? So I can just come and talk to myself? So I, I'm saying that to, to, to make you aware that, uh, that uh, sometimes, you know, you know, we're not consistent as a people. You know, sometimes we spend a lot of time worrying about who's going to win the game tomorrow. You know, who can dunk the ball the best who's the fastest on the track, and we lose sight of the detail around our lives that's having an impact on us. Right now, the European nations are coming together. They're trying to figure out a plan to usurp more of the resources, more of our continent from us, at the same time reducing our populations on the earth. And this is done by design and intentionally. And so what we need at this particular time in our history is information that is transforming, information that is liberating, information that will stimulate us to look past some of the frivolous things that we're involved in and become more serious as a people. It's always good to hear the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because the brothers had a profound impact and effect on my own life personally, as well as Brother Malcolm. And so these two brothers working as a dichotomy, also working as a, uh, a, a profound sense of inspiration for me, have helped to create this individual standing before you. Now in the church, I want to... Uh, Bring a few uh, books to your attention. And this is a, this is a book uh, for before I do that, let's, let's do it by, uh, by uh, the 
uh, this book here is a legendary book. I don't know how many you have it in your library. If you don't have this in your library, I would say that you, you really definitely must put this in the library. You will be missed, and uh, it's, a, it's a great misfortune if you don't have this in the, in, in the library. The Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James. This brother uh, wrote this book and was murdered for writing this book. And in this book, he shows that Greek philosophy, religion, and so forth is nothing more than a product of ancient Kemet, which they call Egypt today. Whenever I say the word Kemet, I want you to know that this word is to be used in interchangeably with Egypt. Kemet and Egypt are, are, are synonyms for the same word. Kemet, Egypt, also Tameri. You may have heard Sister Kenyaka talk about Tameri. Tameri means the gift of the Nile. That's one of the ancient names for Kemet. I'm kind of frowning here because it's, the, the lights are pretty bright, bright so you you got to bear with me here. But, uh, if I could, well, this is camera light, bro. This is camera light. Well, one of the things that, that we have to, one of the things that we have to do is get more involved in doing research and doing reading because it's important that we understand that what George G.M. James says, the, uh, the Egyptian mystery system was the one great holy Catholic religion in remotest antiquity. That's profound. The Egyptian mystery system was the one great Roman Catholic religion in remotest antiquity. And a lot of people start criticizing the Catholic religion. They say, well, yeah, the Catholic religion's got paganism in it, but my religion doesn't have paganism in it. But see, you have to look at the history of Western civilization and how religion came about. The ancient, the, the so-called ancient Romans, the ancient Greeks, they brought Christianity to Europe. Western Europe had no religion other than, than uh, the trifling activities of pagan people who were, who were living in barren caves. So it was the Roman Empire who brought civilization to Greece, excuse me, not to Greece, but to France, to Spain, to England, to the various countries in Western Europe. It was the Romans who civilized Western Europe. It was the Greeks who helped to civilize the Romans. So if the Greeks helped to civilize the Romans and the Romans civilized Western Europe, who civilized the Greeks? This is the question we have to ask. This is a very valid question. Who civilized the Greeks? We have to ask the question, why is it that the nation that is closest to Africa, that's closest to the East, is the first European nation to rise up and become a civilized nation? We have to ask that question. If the Aryan race or the white race is supposed to be the superior race on the earth, why is it that the Nordics in Scandinavia, in Germany, in Norway, in the northern quarters, why is it not that this wasn't the first civilization on the earth rather than Greece that was on the southern periphery closest to Africa? Is that a good question? Yeah. And then how is it that, according to European sources of, of information, that the Europeans left Europe, came into Africa, built a civilization in Africa before they built one for themselves, <laughs> philanthropic goodwill people, left Africa, went back in the darkness before they finally built a civilization for themselves. See, this is, the, this is the logic that they teach us in the school, that the ancient Egyptian civilization was a European civilization, that the Europeans built that civilization in Africa before they built one in Europe. So James dispels all these myths in the Stolen Legacy. Here's a, here's a book by a man about a man named Giordano Bruno, the Hermetic tradition. Now, during the Middle Ages, oh, thank you, bro. During the, during the Middle Ages, uh, Europeans got to the point where they began to study about the origins of Christianity. Now, this particular man, Giordano Bruno, was studying the priesthood. He was in the priesthood. And he began to study the writings of Hermes Tris Magistus. He began to study the writings of a, a book called Sethos which outlined the, the ancient Egyptian religion in a very vague manner. He also studied the writings of Plutarch and various uh, uh, books that had been translated that had reached Europe at this particular time. And after doing his study, even though he was a priest, he said, I want to get rid of this stuff. This is what this man said. He called the Egyptian religion the Presco Theologia or the religion behind all religions. And he demanded that they return back to this particular form of religion and in fact was burned at the stake for arguing that position. Now this is Giordano Bruno during the, during the period just before the Renaissance. Mozart, you heard of Mozart. 
Wolfgang, Amadeus, Mozart, he wrote a play called The Magic Flute. And in this particular play, he had what you call Masonic overtones. And in this particular, in, in, in this particular play, he showed the ancient Egyptian religion, again, as being superior to the church. In this, in this play, uh, Mary Ann uh, Teresa, who was the queen of the night, represented the church. And as men who were being rigorous, rigorously trained in the arts and the sciences, they were moving away from the church, more, more towards science, more towards a pure religion. And the ancient Egyptian religion personified that. But see, most of us, we don't get into that. We sleep. We go to sleep. We can't stay awake. We want to watch the game. We want to play basketball and football and run track. John G. Jackson came out with a book called Christianity Before Christ. This brother is in his 90s. And the brother is living in a home now. The brother is, uh, can't take care of himself now. But this brother wrote this book. And this book is his legacy. And so all of us should have that in our libraries. Christianity Before Christ. A small pamphlet also written by uh, uh, John G. Jackson. Very powerful pamphlet. The African Origin of Christianity. Of course, this book by my mentor and teacher, Dr. Yosef Binyakinen, this, this may be the best book that we have on the subject by a black scholar, in my opinion, not just because he's my teacher, but I've had an, an opportunity to look at a lot of books related to the subject, but this brother goes in detail on this particular subject, the African origins of major Western religion. So this is another book that you must get into your library. Another book that has recently come out, and this is a brother that just that, that inspired me maybe 12, 13 years ago to get into this field in the first place. The Black Truth by Asar Jabal. A profound book dealing with the origins of Christianity. Very important book for your library. The Black Truth. We got so much white truth, we should be happy to get the, the Black Truth. So here's the Bible. Thomas Jefferson. A lot of y'all love Thomas Jefferson, the man that did the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson started studying ancient Egypt. Thomas Jefferson started studying the ancient papyrus and scrolls and scripts and manuscripts and said, this Bible has been messed with. He took out all the virgin birth stories, a lot of the legends of Christianity, he took it out of the Bible and just put Jesus in the category with Socrates and the other, his, other, uh, the other uh, philosophers in history. This is how much he was inspired by his studies of ancient Egypt. How many of you knew that? That he wrote a Bible called the Jefferson Bible. This is what, this is what he was reading, stuff like this, the divine parameter of Hermes Trees Magistus. Jefferson, Mozart, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, the so-called founding fathers, all of them were studying these. They were deists. And whenever they said one nation under God, you notice they never said one nation under Christ. They always say God. They use a generic term. They say God. They never once in their documents said Christ. Because they understood the concept of God was much broader than that. Don't take my word for it. You got to study. You got to do research. That's one thing I always say. Don't believe nothing I tell you. Take note. Question it. Go out and see if what I'm saying is the truth. I'm a professional educator and teacher. And I don't come in here playing, I come in here to tell the truth. So, of the three great religions that we have, this is the first book that comes down to us, which they call the Torah, which was called the Pentateuch before that, which is the Old Testament, which is composed of five books written by a, a scribe by the name of Moses. Are we in agreement with that? And from this particular book, the Pentateuch, or the Torah, this becomes the basis of Christianity's Old Testament. And it becomes the basis for the Holy Quran in Islam. Then you had the New Testament also that came just before the, the advent of the Quran. Now here's what we call the lost books of the Bible. First, the Bible, this is the King James Version. This is the version that most black people swear by. You got a lot of versions of the Bible, but this is the one that most of us in the United States go by. I go by the Bible, I go by the Bible. Going right by it, never go in it to see what's in the book. Don't even read the book. Sometimes you walk into a house and the book is open. 
the page is sitting right in the middle on the, on the counter or somewhere, and all the pages right in the front are all brown. Then you open it up here, the pages are white inside because they never read the book. So the Bible came after the Torah, and when they put the Bible together the way we get it today, they took some books out of the Bible. This is at the Nicene Conference of Bishops in 323 AD, under the supervision of Emperor Constantine, they removed books of the Bible, and this particular book is called The Lost Books of the Bible, which contains some of the books that they removed at that council, at that meeting. So-called inspired scribes. In one of these books it said that Jesus had an older brother by Mary. She had him and remained a virgin and then had Jesus. So you see why that book got lost. This is the lost books of the Bible. Then we got the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran. The Holy Quran contains information about Moses, contains information about Jesus. The only difference between the Holy Quran and the Bible, the, the biggest difference is that Jesus is a prophet and not the Son of God. The Torah does not recognize Jesus as being anything. But before all of these books, laws books, Holy Bible, Holy Qurans, Holy this, Holy that, this is the oldest book in the world. The oldest written book and text that comes down to us today. The ancient book of coming forth by day, which they call the book of the dead. This is an ancient text that was put in the, in the tombs and temples of those pharaohs, those kings, those personalities, those people who had gone on to the ancestral world. And in this particular book is a story about resurrection from death and about the judge of the dead and the judge of the underworld. The first concept of a resurrection story. The first concept of an immaculate conception. The first concept of a commandment, which they call Ten Commandments of Moses. They have 42 commandments in this particular book. All ten of Moses' commandments can be found in those 42 declarations of innocence. This is important because all three of the books I just showed you, the, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran, they all go back to a single individual figure in history. That is that man named Moses. Now Moses was an Egyptian. His name was Egyptian. You heard of pharaohs like Ramesses, Thotmes, Am Amos. Moses is an Egyptian name. So Moses was named by the pharaoh's daughter, they said, that raised him as her own son. And he even passed for the pharaoh's grandson in the pharaoh's house. So the pharaohs of the 18th and 19th dynasty period were black pharaohs. There's no doubt about that. The 18th dynastic period pharaohs go all the way back to a queen named Amosi Nefertari, who was an Ethiopian. And I don't, I'm not going to show the blackness of Egypt tonight because we want to deal with religion, but we can come back and deal with that if anybody has doubts about the blackness of the ancient Egyptians. Pharaoh said, I won. Ramesses' father, those pharaohs were black pharaohs. There's no doubt about that. And if Moses lived in the house and passed for the grandson of these particular pharaohs, and these pharaohs were black, then that tells you what Moses was. He was also black. How many of you knew that? So this is, this is profound. Most of us, you know, we go through, uh, through life with white angels in the, in the stained glass windows. White uh, Jesus, a white Moses, a white God, a white ten disciples. Ain't no black folks in the picture. Nope, not even the floors in the picture, in the mural. Just not there at all. So the Egyptian temple mother of the church is a lecture that is intended to shock. Even the Jehovah Witnesses, they got a book out here, too. They, they got a book themselves. We're going to show you something about Jehovah Witnesses also that probably some of you didn't know. So what we do, we can do now is we can get the lights here and we can start the, the presentation. start with Dr. King's church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, <clears throat> because again, the, the title of this particular lecture is the Egyptian temple, mother of the Christian church. And so Dr. King was prophetic. And all of us, all of our lives have listened to everyone else in the world tell us who a prophet is, who the son of God is, who God is, 
who this is, who that is, always telling and dictating to us who we should worship and who we should recognize as a prophet. And so I contend that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is as much a prophet as any prophet that ever walked the face of the earth. In fact, Dr. King moved more people than any of those prophets put together back during the time of Moses, Jesus, Abraham, all the rest of them. None of them moved the numbers of people that Dr. King moved, impacted, and influenced. So this is the great temple of, of Ptah in the area called Menefer, which they call Memphis today. And all that remains of this particular temple, the temple of Ptah, is rubble and ruin. And this particular temple is located in the uh, northern part of, uh, of Kemet or Egypt or Africa, right near the Mediterranean. And it is in this particular place where the invasions took place to the greatest extent. And so when you go to the temples in that particular area, you find the temples desecrated and ruined beyond recognition. So this is what happened in this particular place called the Temple of Ptah. Now Ptah was called the, the god of creative intelligence. Here you can see uh, Dr. Yosef Binyakana, the brother who was born a Jew, this brother was born a better Israel, Falasha, in Ethiopia. This brother's ancestry goes back to uh, the Queen of Sheba and Menelik, who traced their blood heritage all the way back to the king, which they call Solomon. So this brother was born directly in the, in the pale of this, of this religion, which we call Judaism, Dr. Yosef Ben Yachna. And so as I sat next to Dr. Ben at this particular point in the trip, we had already covered the entire Nile Valley. And it was clear in my mind at this particular time in 1985 that the ancient Egyptian civilization was the parent of the religion that we call Christianity today. I know that's a bold statement. So the God Ptah, it is written in the holy text that the God Ptah uttered and brought forth creation. He said, in the beginning was darkness, and darkness was on, on the face of the waters. That may sound familiar to you because you see the same thing in the Bible. We move on, we can see here the ancient Egyptians they saw the entire creation as being one. It's just like when you take a, a pie. I like bean pies, or if you like an apple pie, you cut the pie up into various divisions here. And you get a piece, and I get a piece, and she gets a piece, and he gets a piece. Maybe eight or nine or ten people get a piece of the pie. Each of us have a fraction of the whole, but all of it coming from the same piece of pie, even though each of us is individually enjoying that pie, that pie is still a part of a whole. So the ancient Egyptians saw that everything in the universe was nothing more than a fraction of the creator, a fraction of God. And so they created a symbol, which was the open mouth of Ptah, as the symbol that they used for creation, for the wholeness, or for one. So when they wrote fractions, the ancient Egyptians invented fractions. I don't know how many of you know that, but they invented fractions. So when they wanted to write one-fourth, they would put the mouth over four. They wanted to write one-third, they would put the mouth over three or one, uh, one six, they put the mouth over six. So that would show that that one that we put over one over four represented that whole that that fraction belonged to. And so Ptah created the universe, and so all of us are part of that universe, are part of that fraction. So his mouth was a very symbol for oneness and wholeness. So this is Ptah here, and I stand here because you see him holding, just like I'm holding his mic here, and uttering, Ptah had a microphone, and he uttered forth the creation. The God Ptah, the one God. The one God. See, a lot of us thought that, that Moses was the one that brought on the one God. We're going to, we'll deal with all this as we move along here. So the word, the ancient Egyptians believed that creative power resided in each word. The demiurge Ptah called into being by means of his word, that which the heart, thought, and tongue brought forth. It is said of Ra, the, God, the, the gods came into being through his word. So the ancient Egyptians believed in creative utterance, the power in the word. Now, does that sound familiar to any of you? If it doesn't, let's refresh your memory as we go to the Bible. In the book of Genesis, first chapter, the first thing we get into, in the beginning was what? The word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made. We go right back, it says, uh, and he brought forth, it was said, Rob brought forth the, uh, the gods that came into being through his word. Okay, let's keep moving. So the ancient Egyptians built on such a colossal scale, see the people here, that anyone who walked into this particular land would assume that they walked into a land of gods. This is the impression that they wanted to give, that when you walked into this particular land, 
that you were humbled. When you walked before this statuary and the monuments there, it was a humbling experience because they wanted to create a condition when you walked into, the, into their land that their testimonial to God was greater than anyone else on the face of the earth. And therefore, their God was the most powerful God on the face of the earth. So anyone who walks up and sees the pyramids in Kemet will understand the power and the majesty of that ancient kingdom, which we call Kemet, which they call Egypt today. And so the ancient Egyptians said that we were gods, or that we could become as gods. And so a lot of people have problems with that, but I show you Jesus in John chapter 8, where Jesus writes, they were about to kill Jesus, the Jews were about to kill Jesus. The Jews answered him saying, uh, Jesus, we start with Jesus here. Many good works have I shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for, for good works we stone thee not, but for blasphemy and because that thou being a man maketh thyself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said ye are gods. So Jesus is telling the Jews who are about to kill him, they, they're going to kill the man because he said he was a god. And when they're about to stone him, he said, isn't that written? I said, you are gods. So Jesus is reflecting something that the ancient Egyptians were teaching. That you can become as a god. You can become a karast or a Christ as we call it today. The Egyptians said karast, the anointed. The Egyptians said mesu. We say messiah, the anointed one. We just get warm here. We move on. So Charleston Heston said, or was it Moses, Charleston, Moses, Charleston, Charleston, Moses. He said, behold his mighty hand. You remember that, Cecil B. DeMille's and his motion, motion picture extravaganza. We all had chills. We sat there and watched those poor Hebrews leaving Egypt to cross that Red Sea from those vicious, tyrannical ancient Egyptians. But not one of us thought about the story, the detail of the story. The Pharaoh said, the Pharaoh said, uh, let's put it this way. Abraham left the area of Chaldea and said, uh, man, we're starving to death. We can't find any food. We got to go somewhere. So he went into Egypt. He snuck into Egypt with his wife, uh, Sarah. And the ancient Egyptians welcomed them in and gave them some food. And all of a sudden, it was just like a relative that came to visit you, you know. And they said, man, can I come stay with you for a couple of, couple of weeks because hard times here and I need to find me a job. So come on down, brother. You can, you can stay with me. He comes in and He's there for a couple of weeks, and a month goes by, two months go by. The refrigerator is empty all the time. You come home from work, and he's here, and the TV's gone, and the food is gone, and, you know, and, and six months go by, he's still here. He hasn't found a job yet. He said, I got to get this guy out of my house. So the Pharaoh said when, when the Hebrews came in, gee whiz, there's more of them here than me. Let's get them up out of the land. And so the Pharaoh said, get out of my land. And then all of a sudden it says that the God came to the Pharaoh, this is what the Bible says, and hardened the Pharaoh's heart. The Pharaoh had no intention of killing Hebrews. He said, let's get them up out of the land. But then it said that God hardened his heart. God was responsible for his emotion and made him keep them there as slaves. And then all of a sudden he would put a plague on the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh would say, okay, okay, get out, get out, get out. And then as soon as he was getting them out, that God would come back and harden his heart again. He says, stay, stay, stay. That God would attack the Pharaoh again. And Pharaoh would say, get out, get out, get out. And then he's getting ready to get him out. And the God would harden his heart again. And he says, stay, stay, stay. And then the Pharaoh, then the God killed his firstborns. Think of the psychological impacts and ramifications of a story like that. We're talking about an insane creator. Someone who is taking a man who wants the people out in the first place, but still makes the man suffer before he finally lets them go. But this is how it's written to us in the Bible. So he said that Moses parted the sea and allowed the Hebrews to escape the Egyptians. Well, let's go to the fourth dynasty in Egypt. This is a, let's set this story up. There was a pharaoh named Khufu who designed the pyramids of Kemet, the great pyramid of Kemet. This particular pharaoh was on the Nile one day in a boat, and some dancing girls were playing music and dancing for him like a Sunday cruise on the Nile. And so one of the, the dancers dropped the turquoise necklace into the Nile River. And the women were sad and stopped dancing. And the Pharaoh said, what's the problem? And one of them said, well, she dropped her necklace into the Nile. So the Pharaoh summoned his chief priest, a man by the name of Jeddah, Jeddah Monk, over to him and said, brother, what can you do about it? So Jeddah, here we pick up the story. 
Then said the chief lector, Jedima, his magic sayings, he placed one side of the, of the water, lake upon the other, and lying upon a posture, he found the fish-shaped charm. Then he brought it back and gave it to its owner. Now as for the water, it was 12 cubits deep, and it amounted to 24 cubits after it was folded back. He said his magic sayings, and he brought back the water of the lake to its position. So here you can see where the, the magician, or the priest of Kemet, actually folded back the Nile River to the dry bed, went down into the, wa the water bed, picked the, the posture, the, the charm up, came back in the boat, and then folded the water back into its place. That brother did that in the fourth dynastic period. We're talking about 2,700, 2,700 years before the Christian era. Moses was not even born. Moses was not, I repeat, Moses was not even born until the 19th dynastic period. Under the Pharaoh Ramesses, where he had his confrontation with Ramesses II in the 19th dynastic period, approximately between 1250 and 1200, 1200 years BCE. I'm talking about 2700. Subtract, somebody do some math. We're talking about well over a thousand years before Moses was born, this man was parting water in Kemet, in Egypt. How many of you ever heard that before? They never showed you this on National Geographic, on KCET. So the ancient Egyptians believed that, that the Nile River flowed from heaven. That the Nile River was the most important thing in their life, as you can see the desert here. Egypt was a whole desert, it's completely desert, except for along the banks of the river. So the, the river was, was, the, was, the, was the avenue, the highway, and they called it the highway of the gods, the Nile River. And so they had to command water. Water was important to them. They irrigated. They changed the course of the Nile River. So they had to be the masters of water, and so you had these legends of people who could walk on water, who could part water. The magicians, the whole story of being the masters of water was Egyptian because they lived there on the water and depended on the water for life. So you can see where the Hebrews came in there and just plagiarized the story and then they had no geographical, topographical, geological aspects of their area to match the story. As we will prove it as we move along here. So they said Jesus walked on the water. Moses parted the water. All these were Egyptian stories. Ancient Egyptians had all kinds of stories. So then Moses writing this here, well, not, well uh, I guess he, he did write some of this, I guess. It's hard to see how he was writing about, he even wrote about his own death. <clears throat> but we go on, we can see. And when, he was set, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all, let's read along here. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And when, it was, when he was full 40 years old, it came unto his heart to visit his brother, the children of Israel. So it says that Moses was mighty, was, 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 was learned in not just part of it, but Moses had a PhD. Moses had a PhD in Egyptian wisdom. And was, not only that, but he was mighty in the words. You remember Ptah created the universe with his words, his magic sayings. Jedha Monk used his magic sayings to part the river. So here, right in the Bible, Acts the seventh chapter, Moses is said to have been learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So what is all the wisdom? What kind of wisdom did they have in Egypt? Moses was a good student. One of the wisdoms that Moses learned was the concept of one God, and it's from this particular pharaoh that he learned it from, a pharaoh named Akhenaten, or Amenhotep IV. This brother, he had a renaissance in Egypt because the ancient Egyptians had all kinds of symbols on their walls, they, at, at, at no time in Egyptian civilization did they believe in more than one God. At no time. They had a series of deities or symbols which they called netters. Netter is where we get our word nature from. Nature comes directly from the Egyptian word netter. And each God of Egypt represented an attribute of nature. The symbol of gold, silver. Gold was nub, a nub, a neb, symbolized by Hathor in the south. Silver was symbolized by Set. See, each the water was symbolized by noon, also uh, by happy. Geb was the earth. The sun was, was Horus and Ra and, uh, and Aten or Aten. 
So he had symbols for manifestative qualities of nature. This was the first chemistry chart. Like we had H2O and CO2 for symbols of the elements. They had a netter or a human form, an anthropomorphic form or human symbol to represent those elements. And they said that before we were mortal men, we were gods. The Europeans said that all those ridiculous ancient Egyptians said that they were gods before they were men. What our ignorant Europeans didn't understand was that they were saying that be before they were men that we were the elements of nature. And the elements of nature came together, earth, air, fire, and water, to create life. It was a science. That's why the Greeks say, all of them, to a man, that they went there and studied and learned their sciences there in Kemet. As did the Hebrews. And so Moses learned the concept of the one God by Akhenaten because he said, we're getting too carried away with our symbols. Remember the ancestors wrote that the whole thing is around the concept of the one God. So he built a whole city called Akhenaten, which was dedicated to the concept of one God. He institutionalized the concept of one God. This is before Moses was born. How many of you knew that? So Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all go back to a single scribe, an Egyptian who was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian, a man of name Moses. If you remove that man from the picture, you remove all three of the religions. You remove all three of the religions if you remove that man Moses. The man with the Egyptian name and the man with the Egyptian learning. I'm getting somewhere. Y'all feel it? <clears throat> so here we can see Giordano Bruno, the guy I showed you about in the book. He's coming before the courts of Europe saying that I looked into ancient Egypt and found that everything that I've been studying in the priesthood comes right out of Egypt. He's standing before the court and the court says, okay, pal, Mr. Giordano Bruno, this is what we got for you. So this is what happened to him. If I had been teaching this back when he was living, the same thing would happen to me. The same identical thing would happen to me. So they called Africans heathen sun worshipers. They said Tarzan came in and swung on the vine, visited with the heathen sun worshipers. You remember the stories we heard about when we were growing up? those heathen sun worshiping pagan Africans. We have to convert, convert them into a, the great white way. So we go on, we can see with Louis XIV, who also studied Egypt, he wanted to be a sun king like the Egyptian pharaohs. You can see Louis at age 15 in the role of the sun. Look at old Louis here. <coughs> Was he not worshiping the sun? Was he a heathen sun worshiper? <laughs> Louis wanted to be like the pharaoh Sesostris, Sennesri. This brother colonized the entire Mediterranean world and set up the city of Athens. Colonized Europeans all the way up to the Black Sea, this brother uh, Sesostris. Read Martin Bernal's Black Athena. Read uh, uh, Africa and Africans as, as written by classical writers by William Leo uh, Hansberry. Read Sheikh Gatha Diop's Civilization of Barbarism and his African Origin of Major Western Religions by Dr. Yosef Binyakana. So Lewis looked at the walls of ancient Kemet and saw that they had the sun god Horus, so he wanted to be a sun king. And he wanted to be under the protection of a goddess just like Isis and just like Hathor. And so he painted the pictures of himself as the sun king holding the sun scepter under the protection of a goddess, imitating the ancient Egyptians. This is Lewis XIV, the sun king. They said when he went to bed, the sun set. When he rose up in the morning, the sun rose in his court. This was the acme of his court. So Lewis didn't let up. He wanted to be born of a virgin, so he was born of a virgin. You can see the sun over his head here. Lewis saw that the ancient Egyptian priests had leopard skins. So Lewis said, let me go get me a leopard skin. So Lewis wouldn't got him a leopard skin. Still under the protection of the goddesses. Wasn't enough for Lewis. Lewis looked at the temples of ancient Kemet. Egypt, he saw the duality in the, in the design, the principles of their design. The obelisk is outside, so when he built Versailles, he put him a couple of obelisks out in front of his temple, Versailles. But they call us heathen sun worshipers, and then in, behind closed doors, write a play called The Magic Flu. And become the sun king. But right in the Bible, it talks about Jesus and the transfiguration. And, and after six days, Jesus taketh 
Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up unto a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking uh, with him. So they're saying that Jesus just stood up on the hill and was transfigured and just shined like the sun itself. But you notice all the pictures of Jesus, they have like a halo over his head, behind his head. Now halo comes from the Latin root helos. Helios or helos is the sun. Helio, right? Helio Biblia, the sun book. Biblia's book, he, holy, helio, all go back to the sun. Halo, the sun. We don't even think about these etymologies. We're just getting warm here. So here you can see the halo, the sun, the halo shining behind his head. You got the 12 disciples. You got 12 of them. How many months in a year? So here you got Jesus in the middle because he represents the equinox. He represents the sun at the, at the vernal and the autumn equinox in the center. You got six disciples or six months on one side and six disciples or six months on the other. It takes the sun, right now where are we at? We're in the winter. So the sun is making its way on down to the equator. The days are getting longer. We had the longest night of the year back on December 21st, 21st and then we call it the 25th, we celebrate on the 25th, but it was nothing more than a winter solstice. So it takes three months for that sun to get down to the, uh, to the uh, tropic, or excuse me, to the uh, equator, and then it takes three months for it to get back. That's six months. Let's put it this way. Let's go to the map. Here's the sun at the equator right here. So the sun, although we know the earth rotates around in the sun, but from the earth it appears the sun is going back and forth, rising and setting. And so from ancients, as they looked at the sun, they could see that it took, when the sun was at the equator here, let's say the fall, which is Libra. That's when I was born, October, October the 1st. Those people were born in late September and October are people who are called Libras. At that particular time, the sun is right over the equator. When the sun is right over the equator, that means the days and nights are balanced. There's six hours of light, there's six hours of darkness. The sun is balanced. So the sun takes three months to go down to the, to the Tropic of Capricorn, where it's in the winter solstice. And then it takes three months for the sun to come back. That's six months, six deacons, or six disciples. Now what's important is that when the sun is down here in December, the sun is a babe, it's a small sun. It's a weak sun. It's a babe. It is born in a manger on the 25th of December when it's a weak, small baby. And then it begins to come to the equator where it hits Aries, where it becomes the Lamb of God because what? The lamb and the sheep live in the mountains in the high places, up in the mountains, up in the hills. So the lamb becomes the symbol of the peak, the summit, the altar of the earth. Altar comes from the Latin root altus, is the high place. So the ram represents the place of the high place, which is the equator, which is the closest place to the sun. When the sun is at the equator, it's as close to the earth as it ever gets. That's the altar. So that's Aries. And so it takes three months for the sun to come back down here to the Cancer, the crab, where it begins to backslide like the, the crab walks backwards, you know. It backslides back here to the fall, to the scales in Libra. Now, let's talk about the days, the holidays. The Hebrews, they call the sun at the equator during the Aries, the Passover. Passover. You know, we, take, we celebrate Passover. It takes three days for the sun to pass over the equator. It takes three days for Jesus to resurrect from the dead. Okay? So the sun comes on down here, <coughs> comes back to the equator. The Jews have a ceremony which they call the Yom Kippur, or the atonement. The atonement represents... The atoning of the sins. The ancient Egyptians had the scales where the souls would come before the scales to atone for sins before Osiris at the scales. That's what the Jews call Yom Kippur. And then we get down here, we get Hanukkah and we get Christmas. So the whole thing is mapped out, all the holidays are mapped out upon the procession of the sun through the equinoxes. So when the sun gets here at the equator coming from the north, I mean from the south, that's when the sun, life, Resurrection. The animals come out of hibernation. The sun gets strong. Light defeats darkness. The light defeats evil. All the things we fear are, are, are cast away by the light of the world, the sun. 
the S-O-U sun and the S-O-N sun is the same sun. Everybody with me? So here you can see here the seven pole stars, which is to the northern quarters. That's very important. Remember those seven pole stars. So we go to the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. And he showed me, this is the book of Revelation, 22nd chapter. And he showed me a, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Okay? In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. How many fruit did we say? Twelve. Twelve manner of fruit. Constellation of the Lamb. Because when the sun was at the equator at the Lamb, look at the river here. You see this river right here? That's the Nile River. Right here where the sun is at, that's the Great Lakes area of Central Africa. And this is the beginning of the Nile. This is where the ancient Egyptians said in the papyrus of Hunefer, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwells at the foothills of the mountains of the moon. This papyrus is in the British Museum. The ancient Egyptians said as a race of men that they originated at the equator, which they called Acre, the place of the beginning. And they migrated down here to found that particular civilization. This is the only river in the world that flows out from the equator, which is the belly or the navel of the earth. Equator means equal, or to divide an equal half. The earth is divided in half at its belly, at its navel, at the equator. The Nile River is the only river in the world that flows out from the equator. It's the only river in the world that flows south to north, the only one of its kind. So the book of Revelation says that where Jesus is sitting on his throne, there's a river of water of clear as crystal flowing out from the Lamb. There's no Lamb river in Israel, in Jerusalem. Is everybody with me? Go back. Go back. Huh? Go back. You want to go back, brother? Go back to the lamb. Okay, here's the Lamb now. When the, when, the, when the sun is at the Lamb, it's right over the equator, right at the Nile River, and the river flows out the water of life from the garden. Africa is the garden. This is where you find the species of animals. The, the oxygen of the earth is being created by the, by the uh, Ituri forest. This is the garden. Okay, we're going to make it clear. If it's not clear now, it'll be clear by the time we're done here. So we move on. So here you can see in the church where Jesus and Mary are sitting at the throne of God at the feet here and the throne. Now look at the, now look at the symbols here. Now here you can see the sun symbolized by the man in the chariot going through the various constellations. Because Jesus represents, did you see the sun here? He represents the personification of the sun and the sun going through the various constellations and the various deacons, the various disciples. So here you can see the god Apollo. Apollo the sun, Ho Apollo, Apollo was the sun. Apollo was shown as a man in a chariot with the sun going around in the heavens. So here you can see what they've taken this right from Apollo and, and integrated right into the church. And you see Apollo in the chariot as a symbol of the sun with Jesus now as the new savior. He is the one who, who would displace the Roman god Hor Apollo. He becomes the new savior. Jesus became the new savior, displacing the sun god Hor Apollo. Apollo of the Romans displaced Horus, the Egyptian god. Go ahead, let's keep going, let's back it up. Reign Apollo, he is the god of the sun and is shown driving the sun chariot across the heavens. As Apollo of Musagates, he is the leader of the Muses. And as the Pyth Pythian uh, uh, Apollo, he is the python slayer and, and god of prophecy, since his famous oracle called Py Pythia was at Pytho, the old name for Delphi where he killed the monstrous serpent python. Apollo is represented as the most handsome of masterful young men. He has long golden locks and his beautiful body is, is usually only uh, partially draped. As the ideal image of the youthful god, the type was adopted for early representations of both Christ and Buddha. When these gods reached Europe, they took the god Apollo as being the prototype for their Jesus. This is the Europeans, this is what they did. And this is how we came to worship a golden-haired Jesus. 
they took the story and just took their own identity and wrapped it up into the story. Go ahead on, let's keep moving here. So here you can see the sun, or Jesus, sitting right up in the heavens. Okay. This is the sun, the radiant rays of the sun, the helio, halo, halo, helium, the sun. So they show John here as the eagle head. Now is this an animal worship in the church? Isn't that what they said about us? That we worship animals? So here you can see the evangelist John shown as an eagle with the sun behind his head. See where they're getting this from. The God horse with the sun over his head. Let's get it right here so you can see. I want you to say, Brother Matthew is making all this stuff up. So why did they use the sun? The, the hawk as a symbol of the sun. Because the hawk flew around in the heavens in the midst of the sun all day. During the noontime. They love to fly in the noon. And the hawk could swoop down on a serpent and kill the serpent. The serpent is what we fear. There was nothing more in the ancient world or the modern world that is feared more than a serpent. And because the hawk had the ability to kill the thing that we feared most, it became a symbol of the Savior. The bird became the symbol of the Savior. A symbol of the sun. So we know, as we can see here clearly, who were the first to come up with this idea. Clearly it was ancient Kemet. So here you can see Jesus as the python slayer. The sun here, Jesus sets up here, and you see the python. As you can see, there are no pythons in Europe. Pythons are reserved for the southern hemisphere in warm, humid places where there are jungles. Where did the, the Greeks and the Romans get a python from? Is that a valid question? So here you can see where they got it from, right here in Kemet, where the python attacked the sun bark of Ra every day as the sun, the bark would rise up, as the boat would rise up, symbolizing the sun rising up in the east, the python would attack the boat. But the sun would always win out. This was something that took place over and over again in their theology. Go ahead on. Apophis, or, or, or Apis, as they call it sometimes, each morning and evening, the serpent demon threatened the sun god and thus endangered world stability. The huge serpent was the embodiment of the, of the opponent of God and a symbol of the powers of darkness. Therefore, Apophis was equated with Set, which was Set Typhon, or Satan, can't make up their own devil. Satan comes from Set Typhon, which comes from Set. The enemy of the gods, each morning when the sun emerged from the netherworld, each evening at the beginning of its nightly voyage, the sun bark was attacked by the serpent. So it's clear to us today that the sun was attacked in Kemet by the serpent. So here you can see the god Ra symbolized here. He has a rod of iron who is doing battle with the, with the python who is attacking his boat, the solar bark. So here you can see where they just ripped us off what did Malcolm say? We've been hoodwinked. We've been had. We've been bamboozled. We've been hoodwinked. As you see, Apollo is now attacking the python, whore Apollo. We've stolen this right from the god Ra, who was attacking the python. You've been hoodwinked. We go on, we can see here, that's going to be our theme tonight, hoodwink. We're going to run this thing through all, all night. And so we go back to the Bible. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abidon, but in the Greek tongue half his name, Apollyon. So even in the Bible, they're saying the man who is the ruler of the bottomless pit is called Apollyon. Right there in the Bible. Now On is the Egyptian word for the sun capital of On. Apollo is simply Horus, the sun. So the sun is doing battle with the serpent at the bottomless pit right there in the Bible. So here you can see Horus standing on the crocodile holding the serpents and the, and the uh, scorpions, the lions, everything you see, the, you see the pythons here, or in ancient Egypt, it's the sun Horus that does battle with everything that we fear and he becomes the savior, the lord of the world. So you see where they got this from. Michael the angel slain the dragon in the book of Revelation on be in behalf of Jesus. Slain the dragon. What is a dragon? Where do white folks get a dragon from? 
Ain't no dragons, no such thing as a dragon. They got the dragon right here, a crocodile. This is the prototype for the European dragon because they had never seen a, a, a crocodile until they came into Africa. And so the, the, so the, so the crocodile became the prototype for the European dragon. As you see him with the rod of iron, as you can see Ra, uh, Ra here with the rod of iron, slaying the, slaying the python. As you see Horus slaying with the rod of iron, Set Typhon. As we say again, the python was also a symbol of Set. The pig was a symbol of Set. The hippopotamus was a symbol of Set. All of them represented ego, and the way to slay them was with a rod of iron. So Horus, as you saw Ra before him, slaying the evil one with a rod of iron, as you see the archangel angel Mark, Michael slaying the dragon with a rod of iron. Moses parts water, we part water. We slay with a rod, they slay with a rod. We got 12 deacons, they got 12 deacons. Okay, let's keep moving. And so we go right to the Bible again, Revelation. And he had, and he, and he, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Now the morning star in Egypt is the star Sothis or Sirius, which is equated with the god Horus. Horus is the morning star. Okay? Horus rules with the rod of iron. Okay, let's go see it. Here's the morning star, and here's Horus ruling with the rod of iron. Here you can see the star system Ceres, or Sirius, and this is the constellation of the bear here. This represents the northern heavens. Remember I said pay attention to those pole stars, those seven stars? Now this is why I said that. We can ready to pay attention to it. Let's move here and see it. So here you can see the god Horus ruling with iron as he stands on the mooring post, which is called a thigh, which represents the seven pole stars. Here you can see it again. The thigh right here representing the, the seven pole stars here. And you can see again Horus ruling the northern heavens, this whole area, with the rod of iron. Keep going. Here you can see at the Temple of Dendera, again, Horus holding up the heaven, the vault of heaven. Isis, Hathor, holding up the vault of heaven with Horus, the mother goddess. As Horus rules the heavens, he's ruling the heavens with a rod of iron. You can see the thigh here again, the seven pole stars, the great bear, the northern quarter. Let's keep going. Here you see Jesus ruling the northern quarter, ruling the constellations. Uh, okay, everybody with us? Huh? So the mother goddess, Jesus sets on the throne of Isis. Or, excuse me, I meant Mary. Jesus sets on the throne of Mary as Horus sat on the throne of Isis, or the lap of Isis, to rule the northern heavens, to rule the heavens, the throne of God. Let's keep moving. So the Jehovah's Witnesses say the mother goddess is still worshipped. Jehovah's Witnesses are attacking the Catholic Church. They're saying the Catholic Church is still worshiping the black Madonna and child. They say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. They're saying that by doing that, they're still worshiping Isis, where Horus sits on the lap of his mother, Isis. They're saying that this is the same thing. That's what the Witnesses are saying. But the witnesses, we, they can't get away either. It's in their book too. Let's demonstrate this here. Let's go to the book of the dead. The oldest book, I show you the oldest book in the world. The seven spirits. The, the Tatcha, around about Osiris, or Kesta, Happy, Tamutep, and Kabbalah Sanu. They are also round about the constellation of the thigh, the great bear in the northern sky. I showed you the thigh. The great bear of the northern thigh. The, the, of the northern sky. Let's see this go forward here. Again, you can see the thigh right here. Go back, the seven spirits. That's the seven pole stars. There's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing else, there's only seven pole stars. There's no other stars in the system that represent seven other than the pole stars. 
in the northern heavens. That's when they say seven, unmistakably, this represents the seven pole stars. There's no doubt about that. So this is what they have, the ancient Egyptians, the great bear in the northern sky. That's what Horus is, the seven spirits, that's what Horus is ruling about his throne. Let's keep going. Go to the, let's go to the Bible. After this I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven and, and, and the first voice went on to say, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. That's Mary's throne at, that Jesus is on the lap sitting on this throne in heaven. Okay. Around about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting cloth in white raiment and they had on their heads uh, crowns of gold. And uh, out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. So Jesus is on this throne in the northern heaven with the seven pole stars around about his head as you see Horus sitting on his throne in the northern heaven sky with the seven spirits. Seven spirits. Who are the gods who are in the train of Horus? They are Casta, Happy, Tamutep, and Kabbalah Snoop. Homage to ye, O ye lords of right and truth, ye sovereign princes, Tatcha, who stand around about Osiris, who do away utterly sins and offenses. Do away with the sins and offenses. Destroy ye all the faults which are within me, even as ye did for the seven spirits who are among the followers of their Lord Sepia, as you see the name of Osiris. Osiris is the Lord of the heaven and the earth. He is the God of the underworld, the one who judges the dead, who judges to find out whether someone has been righteous and true and deserving of eternal and everlasting life. He is the judge of the dead and Lord of the seven spirits. Lord of the seven spirits. At what point does possibility become probability? At what point will we acknowledge that these people are writing right out of our book and putting this information right in their book? Is everybody with me? Before the throne were a sea like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around them, this is all the book of Revelation now. This is the book that the preachers, those preachers emphasize this book more than any other book. The book of Revelation. The revelation of St. John. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast had a face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. So Jesus is at his throne now. And he's got four beasts around his throne. Okay. I said... Osiris was said, he had Casta, ha, uh, uh, Casta Happy Tamutep, and Kabbalah Sanuf, how much do ye, ye, ye lords of right and truth, ye sovereign princes, Tatcha, who stand around about Osiris, right? Around about Osiris. Around about the throne of Jesus, okay? Four around Osiris, they got four around Jesus. Let's go look at the four. Here's the four of Osiris. Emseti, Happy, Tamutep, Kabbalah Sanuf. Man-headed, one, ape-headed, another, jackal-headed, the other, and a falcon-headed for the last. Okay? One man, three zoo types. Everybody see that? Go to Jesus. Okay, we are not Jesus yet. Here's a picture of the, or what I was just talking about. Man-headed, hawk-headed, jackal-headed, ape-headed. Okay? These are called canopic jars. Go ahead on. Four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, the authors of the accounts of the life of Jesus known as the four Gospels are called the evangelists. They are symbolically represented by a man, Matthew, a lion, Mark, ox, Luke, and an eagle, John. Okay? Got a man and three zoo types. Is this animal worship in the church? Keep going. So here's Jesus in the northern heavens at the equator where the sun is crossed where you have six deacons or six rams on one side six on the other six on one side six on the other over the northern heavens you can see the clouds all he's all up in the heavens up in the sky with the beast one man and three zoo types at his throne here's Osiris on his throne with his four sons man, ape, hawk and jackal 
The jackal replaced the lion. The ape replaced the ox. The eagle replaced the hawk or, or the falcon. And the man stayed the same except for he became a white man with Jesus on the throne. Just took it right out of our book and said it was a revelation of St. John. This is a revelation of Matuatu, revealing how St. John went and took our ancestral teachings and writings, usurped it, camouflaged it, and therefore stole it because they didn't admit that this is where they got it from. So here's Jesus, the white Jesus. This is not the real Jesus. I'm going to show you who the real Jesus is. We're going to see the real Jesus painted from the Roman catacombs. Looks nothing like this one. You can see the, the ox, the falcon, the, the eagle, the man. Just took the symbolism right out of our temples. Now, in the Bible it says that Mary and the other Mary came to Jesus at his sepulcher when he rose up from the dead. Here you can see Isis with the throne and Nebhet, her sister, with the house of her head who comes before Osiris to help raise him from the dead. I said Isis was the throne. That's her symbol. Whenever you see a, a throne over a woman in Kemet, I don't care what she looks like, if you see this symbol over her head, that's Isis. If you see this symbol over any person in Egypt, that's Nebhet. Nebhet is her sister. These two women came to Osiris saying, come to your house, O Lord, come to your house. Come to your house, O Lord. Return to your maternal womb, to your maternal house, to rise up from the dead. They were there to help him rise up from the dead. These two women were symbolically represented by the two towers in front of the Egyptian temple, which we call pylons, Nebhet and Aset. So here you can see Mary and the other Mary coming before Jesus, who's a mummy, as Osiris was, to help him resurrect from the dead as Aset and Nebhet came to help Osiris raise himself up from the dead. Now why is he a mummy with the sun behind his head? Osiris was the first mummy, the first resurrected savior in human history. Osiris was murdered. His body cut up into 14 pieces and scattered throughout the Nile Valley. Isis longed for her husband and went up and down the Nile looking for the parts of his body, found all except for one, which was the phallic or the male member, the penis. And because she could not find the penis, she raised an obelisk or the ben ben as a symbol of his assured resurrection. The same ob oblix that you see George Washington had a monument built in Washington, D.C. is nothing but a big penis. That's what it represented, a penis. Clear and simple. Resurrection, erection, resurrection, the same thing. So Cyrus was the first erect. Erect means to stand up. The first to, from a prone position to erect himself and mastered death, just as he had mastered the waters. And you notice one thing about him, he doesn't look like uh, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's character. He's black just like the people are black. See him again here, the black Osiris, Unefer the good God, the good shepherd he was called. You see his flails and his crooks, his crooks, he was a good shepherd. He was a good shepherd. You see him all the time, the good shepherd. Looks just like your uncle. Look at this. Clearly an African. This is Osiris, the first resurrected savior in human history. There are at least 16 crucified saviors. He is the oldest one. Predates Christ by 4,100 years. 4,100 years before Christ. Here's the Pope wearing his hat. He's got Osiris' hat on right here. The Pope. Look at that Osiris' penis doing resurrection or erection during Easter. All these people out here before the penis and the Pope is looking at it. He called us a heathen sun worshiper. Why has he got this pagan symbol sitting right in the middle of his court celebrating resurrection from the dead? With the four sons of Osiris, the lion and the ox and so forth on the other side is the uh, hawk and the man. The four son symbols of Osiris, the sun's on his hat, looking out at his penis. So here's, this, you see Osiris, I said Isis couldn't find the penis. So here you see Isis coming as the bird. You saw the bird with the throne on her head coming to resurrect Osiris. She lands right over his phallic to receive the seed from the dead Osiris so she could be 
conceived. This is the first immaculate conception in recorded history. Isis comes as a bird to receive the seed of the slain and fallen Osiris so he can erect and raise up from the dead. So here's the Pope hoping Mary would come over him and receive him, his seed so he can resurrect from the dead like Osiris did. We now take you to Dr. Yosef A. A. Benyekinen. Dr. Ben is expounding on the story of the resurrection of Osiris at the Great Ceremonial Center at Abydos, dedicated to Osiris. Here is a penis that early people tried to kill out. If you are Christian, you said that the Muslim did it. If you're Muslim, you said the Christians did it. Somebody did it. That's one thing we're sure. And here it is, Osiris and the resurrection. You have no doubt about it, I'm sure. Uh, his penis was, his wife supposed to order Isis that symbols of his penis be erected and that turned out to be the obelisk. This is a story. All religion are based upon stories. They start with certain myths and certain things. This is the myth of Osiris. It's no worse and no better than the myth in Christianity, the myth in Judaism, the myth in Islam. All are based on myth. Come over to this. Put Jesus in the place of God, Horus. And put Osiris in the place of Joseph, G Joseph Jehovah. Now, in the story of Matthew here, that Joseph was traveling and he went into this village and found this girl Mary. He loved her and betrothed her, got engaged to her. He left her and came back. Three months time after returning, he noticed that she was showing, obviously pregnant, and he said, what happened? She said, I'm pregnant. What he said in Matthew, thou art a whore. But he went to sleep that night and the angel of the Lord came and said, Joseph, think not ill of the woman, for what she has in her is not of man, but of an angel of the Lord. Okay, an angel of the Lord is a bird? All right, let's see where the story come from. This is more than 4,000 years before Jesus. Okay, so Jesus' story, this thing copied from Jesus, Jesus copied from this. Okay, is that a bird? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Now we know the, who the bird is because we see the name. That name is the name of who? Isis. Isis. Good. Is this a penis? Yes. yes. They took it out. Is this penis belonging to a man that we could identify as Osiris? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This penis is entering what? <laughs> the vagina of the bird, right? Mm -hmm. To put the holy sperm. To carry it, that sperm. To carry it into the wall that is destroyed. The face was I talk about that was there on, in 39, it was there. Mm. Now, you see Isis sitting in the birth chair with her with her breast, with yes. a with a, a breast caused distension and, and, and thickened nipple from pregnancy. You see her impregnated stomach sitting in the birth chair. Yes. This way Jesus, Mary, and Joseph was coming mm. from. Mm. Mm. Oh, nice. mm. Yeah. They, 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 they destroyed the world, they destroyed the evidence. The same as they've done everywhere. Yes. I just told you. And this wall was scenes connecting the two things. Oh, scenes right. of her pregnant, scenes of her coming down to the delivery. Mm. Mm. You had a chance to see that before you saw it? Yeah, the first one came on the floor. You know? Right. It's all clear. So here's this, you see Osiris. I said Isis couldn't find the penis. So here you see Isis coming as the bird. You saw the bird with the throne on her head coming to resurrect Osiris. She lands right over his phallic to receive the seed from the dead Osiris so she could be conceived. 
This is the first immaculate conception in recorded history. Isis comes as a bird to receive the seed of the slain and fallen Osiris so he can erect and raise up from the dead. So here's the Pope hoping Mary would come over him and receive him, his seed so he can resurrect from the dead like Osiris did. Laying prone with his hat on, even got his bench. Can't even make up his own bench, Osiris' bench here. He's laying on his bench, got his hat on with, ice, with Mary coming over his penis to resurrect him from the dead. See, the symbolism is profound. White folks are good at symbolism. That's why you see the, the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. Why do you think they put that pyramid back there? Just, they just walk up one day, aha, just put a pyramid here. It's a philosophy behind that pyramid on that dollar bill. So this is the place, Abydos, the first holy city where people make pilgrimages from all around the world, from Greece, from Rome, from uh, Asia Minor, from Southern Africa, from East Africa, from West Africa, all coming to the shrine of Osiris in hope that they would resurrect from the dead. Here at Abydos, the first holy city where they show again Isis coming as a bird where the Europeans chiseled out his penis. They got a sorry European, they can only look at the body in a decadent uh, way and fashion through a Playboy magazine or a penthouse, jerking off somewhere. They can't look at the body in its natural state and understand nature. They came in and saw the Hawaiians and the Africans, made the women put coconut shells on their breasts, then snatched the, the shells off and raped them. You go in Africa today, you see women walking around, man, with breasts. And you, you brothers couldn't go over there, man, because you'd be after the woman trying to grab a breast from what the white folks have trained us, how they train us to think. The breast is for no other reason but to give this little man life, to give that little man life, that little man life, that sister life, to raise our children up to life. That's what a breast is for. Or heard some brothers said that, that oh no, God gave them two breasts, one for the kid, one for me. <laughs> so, brother, you got a problem, brother. Those breasts is for the kids, both of them. <laughs> we get, you know, we can admire them for a while. We got to give them up, brothers. I'm telling you. But here you can see Osiris again holding his penis, showing the relationship between that and the spirit in his mind, his soul. It's a part of you. It's a part of your soul, part of your spirit. This is procreation. This is the evidence that we have of God. None of us have control over our ability to reproduce. That's something we're born with. That's the God quality in us. We have nothing to do with that quality. There's a relationship between the mind, spirit, and this. Thus Osiris was by no means some remote transcendent deity such as Ray, the sun god, but one who had endured the grim ordeal to which awaited all men. In his image, moreover, the Egyptian devotees saw also the promise of their own resurrection from death and eternal life in the realm of Osiris. Phenomenologically, if not historically, Osiris was thus a prototype, a prototype of Christ and may have prepared a way for him to some extent. Osiris may rightly claim to have been worshipped longer than any other god. This statue shows him wearing the white crown of Egypt and holding the royal crooks and flail. So, for 4,100 years before Christ, 527 years afterwards, Osiris was worshipped. 4,627 years, Osiris was worshipped as the Lord and Savior of the then known world. Jesus has to go, it's not even 2,000 years old yet. He's got to go another 2,600 years just to break even with Osiris. So here's Jesus coming and helping to resurrect Lazarus, resurrect Lazarus from the dead before he resurrected himself from the dead. Here's Lazarus as a mummy. Where are all these symbols coming from? Here the Romans, when they came into Egypt, mummified themselves and painted their pictures on the, on the mummy. It all goes back to Osiris, the first resurrected mummy. You see Jesus born in a manger, wrapped up like a mummy. With the goddess half far protecting him, the cow goddess right over Jesus in the manger. The cow goddess over Jesus as a mummy in the manger. Osiris, the Karaz, the Mesu, the anointed, Messiah, Mesu, Karaz, Christ, 
has exactly the same meaning, the anointed one. Here you see Osiris as the judge of the dead. The deceased coming before Osiris, their hearts being weighed at the scales, Yom Kippur, the atonement, the heart being weighed against the feather of truth. This man has been found right and just, therefore this hideous beast will not devour him, and he goes before Osiris, being led by Horus, who rules the northern heavens with the rod, holding the key of life, Horus, brings him before his father Osiris who was murdered and says, yes, this man is true and right and is deserving of eternal life in your realm, the realm of Osiris. The judge of the dead. Jesus on the throne. The dead coming before Jesus. The scales. Yom Kippur. Being weighed so this will not be devoured by the hideous beast. So he can go into the realm of Jesus. To have eternal life. I said, let me go back here one more time here. I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves. Not be devoured by the hideous beast at the scales before Osiris. The scales before the beast before Osiris. Where did he get scales from? To weigh the soul with Jesus at his throne. This is where they get the scales from, right here. All over Egypt, up and down, down up, sideways, all over Egypt, you find scales everywhere. With Osiris at the throne as the judge of the dead, the judge of the underworld. Everybody with me? Can you see this? Everybody's awful quiet. I hope this is not too disturbing. But that scene, this scene here, is right over the main portal at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Right here in Paris. Now, Noter, Noter means our. Okay? Dane means lady. Like the mob, the mobsters. You remember the mafia used to say in those movies, that dame over there. That dame over there. Dane means woman. A mother, a woman. Our lady, Noter Dane, par. Asut or Paris, Par of his house in Egyptian, Asut is Isis. Paris or Paris is the house of Isis. So when you see Notre Dame de Paris, you're saying Our Lady, the house of Isis. So in Our Lady, the house of Isis, you see Mary with Jesus, and the main portal, you see Osiris with the judgment scene right over the portal. We have disguised this and put it right into the temple. And so the temple here, or the cathedral and basilica, represents the Bible in stone. They are telling the, the story of the Bible in the building itself, what they call architectonics, when you design the theme of the book right into the building. To go into this is to go into the womb of Our Lady, of our great mother, is what they're telling you. To go back to the maternal womb for judgment, from the womb you came to the womb you returned. The heavens above give birth to the star. Creation itself is feminine. The process of the black universe giving birth to stars and solar systems by definition is feminine. The first creation of the earth and the universe is femininity. That's first. That comes first. You can't survive with your daddy. You need those two breasts, man. You can't get along without it. That had to be here first. That's what our ancestors taught. You ain't got no rib mark here. You got an umbilical cord to show you came from your mama. Any brothers got problems? I have no problem with that. Women were here first. Clear and simple. From everything I've seen, every piece of documentation, scientific and otherwise, women were here first. It's the patriarchal society of Europe that changed this story. I would want to be here without my mama. I want my mama to be here first. She ain't here. I want to come here. So here you see Jesus again standing over the main portal with the dead coming before him showing you where they just copy these things right out of our temples. And he saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open in which is the book of life. Book of Revelation still. We're still Revelation. We ain't going to let this revelation go at all. And dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. 
And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So what the Bible is telling us here, as the Cathedral of Notre Dame is telling us, is that some point in the future, this is the theology of Christian eschatology, some point in the future, Jesus comes back. But all these people who have been dying over the centuries, at one point they will rise up from the dead, go before Jesus, even though they were dead once, they go before Jesus to be judged for eternal life. If they're found just, they live forever. If they're found evil, that's the second death. Okay? That's the second death. So death and hell, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay? Let's go back to the book of the dead. Chapter of not being boiled in fire. I said, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Chapter of not being boiled in fire. Lake of fire. Book of the dead now. Revelation, book of the dead, they got a lake, we got a lake, okay? Who devours the bodies of the dead and swallows the hearts? Who, do, who, who voided filth, but who himself remaineth unseen? Who is this greyhound-faced dog? God. His, I said God because he's dog, God backwards is dog. I, I, I got crossed up there. Who is this greyhound-faced God? His name is Everlasting Devourer. He liveth in the domain of fire or in the lake of aunt. Is as concerning the domain of fire, it is at Ot, which is uh, uh, Narutef, and is near the Sinu chamber. The sinner who walketh over this place falls down among the knives of the watcher. In other words, a person who has sinned, who walks over this area of the lake, will fall into it to be devoured. And he said that, that the death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And what does this thing says? Again, dealing again with the lake of fire, and it comes back to the lake of fire where we see geographically, geologically, this is the area that they're talking about, the same area that I showed you on that earlier map. It showed the Nile River flowing out from the beginning. And this is the proof right here. This is the proof of where they're getting this from. Again, the Nile River starts in this area, the Great Lakes region of Central Africa. Flows down 4,100 miles all the way to Egypt, giving life to that barren desert, which is Egypt. Without this river, there would be no life in Egypt. So ancient Egyptians looked to the south as being the God's land. They called this land Ta-Neter, T-A-N-E-T-E-R. They called this, this land Punt, P-U-N-T. They called this the God's land. They called it now the highway of the gods. And they said that the ancestors came down here to create Egypt. And so they believed the souls would go back because this is where they came from. The soul would also go back here to be judged at the high place the altar, the altus, the high place of the earth at the equator. And there was a 40 volcanoes around the lake. And when these volcanoes erupt and pour over into the valley, they create the lake of fire. And Osiris is the judge of the underworld who determines whoever is just, whether or not they're just or unjust, and whether or not they'll go to heaven above or to hell below. This is what Osiris said on his throne. So you can see the geographical, topographical, and geological explanation for the story in Africa and you cannot see it here in Jerusalem. This is the legendary lake of fire that the ancient Egyptians were talking about. When those volcanoes in Africa went off, everything moved. The first primordial mother, they call her Lucy or Dagnesh or the mitochondrial mother, I don't care what you call her, when she came on the scene, the first mother according to science, according to the Egyptians, according to everyone who ever wrote in antiquity, came from that particular area in dead Central Africa. Whether you're talking about anthropology or you're talking about genetics, don't make any difference. Same place, they go right back to the same place. So when those volcanoes went off, everything started to move. You see the elephants, the giraffes, people, the birds, everything is moving, creating migrations down the Nile, bringing with them the story of the lake of fire, the mountain of the beginning. These are legends that began to mold and shape and fashion the religion which we call the religion of the ancient Egyptians, coming from the south. Avoiding the second death. 
chapter of not dying a second time. The second death is right in the book of the dead. And he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega. Revelation still, the beginning and the end, I will give unto him that a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. But the fearful and unbelieving and the indomitable murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Right in the Bible, just taking our second death, our lake of fire, putting it right in the Bible. Anybody got problems with that? So here you can see Osiris on his throne with the dead who are thirst for the water, the fountain of life, for coming before the tree of Hathar, the mother goddess, received the, the drink from the fountain at Osiris' throne. He said he will give him that a thirst of the fountain of life, of water, of life freely. Right in the Bible. Here's the fountain of life in the book, in the, in the uh, cathedral. You see the gates of heaven. See, this is a complex, this is a very complex issue we're talking about here. What you're talking about here is thousands of years of evolution in terms of religion and teaching that have been crafted into a single book, which we call the Heliobiblia of the Holy Bible. And so what we're trying to do here in the course of a couple of hours is to try to, is to, try to show you something that really we could teach you about for the next five years to really get the point across. I said architectonics earlier is when you design a theme into a building. So the cathedral represents the Bible in stone. So we know Adam and Eve, according to the Bible, were supposed to be the first people on the earth. And these people were supposed to have sinned in the garden and were booted out of the garden. So here you can see with Adam and Eve are being booted out of the garden because of the archangel, the devil, the red, the red devil here, symbolized here by this archangel, the devil, where he's kicking them out of the garden because they bit the apple. Eve, Eve picked the apple and tempted him. He ate the apple and because of that, God, their symbol of God, expelled them out of the garden. Okay? So the cathedral represents the throne of God, the garden of the beginning. So Adam was kicked out of the garden. So the only way that man is supposed to get back into the garden now is through Jesus. See, Jesus, the sun god, becomes the second Adam. And because he died on the cross, you're supposed to be able to go to heaven to return back to the garden where Adam sinned at, which is a dead central Africa. I said, man, Brother Batu, you mean to tell me that the whole cathedral drama is talking about dead central Africa? This is what I've been saying all along, that this entire drama of the heavens this entire drama of the Cathedral Basilica throughout Europe is representative of the Nile Valley. That's what it represents. So the fountain of life was the Nile River, and Adam in the garden was in Africa. It even says so in the Bible, and I'm going to show it to you right now. Again, the river we show, and the river that showed, uh, showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. We've been over that. I show you the Lamb was at the constellation of the equator, when the sun is at the equinoxes, that's the only river in the world that flows out from the equator, the Lamb. Jesus was the second Adam. So Jesus is sitting at his throne when the river is flowing out from the garden, the place where the souls return back to the high place, the altar of the earth, for judgment. Is that clear? Is that clear? In the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden, where Adam is living at, this is what they say about the, the garden. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from this it was parted and came into four heads. The name of the first is Pisan, that which can pass the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold. There's Bedellium and Anak stone, okay? The name of the second river is Gihon, the same as that which can pass what? The whole land of what? The whole land of Ethiopia. Then the third and fourth river, rivers of the high Tigris and Euphrates River. What the Bible is showing us here is that the river Havilah, if you, look in the, if you look in Genesis, you see that Havilah is one of the sons of Cush, one of the sons of Ethiopia. Havilah represents the white Nile coming out of Uganda, Tanzania, dead Central Africa. The Gihon represents the blue Nile coming down from the highlands of Ethiopia. They meet together and flow out into the Mediterranean. So the place where Adam is living, the very first place, the first two rivers, in the garden with the white and the blue now. This was the garden. This is where Adam lived. And so in the cathedral, 
is showing us this. They're saying that the place where Adam was living at, the fountain flowed out from Ethiopia, from their Central Africa. That was the high place of the earth. Can everybody see that? Where the Jack Knight preachers that have been preaching this stuff and never show you this in the scripture? I want this to be clear. This is important. Our whole lives are wrapped up in this stuff here. So Moses here, when he came, he was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He saw that in the papyrus of Hunetha, Osiris sitting on his throne, sometimes his sons are shown to just four men, just like the gospel four. Where the dead are coming before Cyrus to be judged. The papyrus of Hunefer is showing again the river of life, the Nile River at his feet, flowing out where it breaks up in the four heads. With a black man, brown man, red man, and yellow man, where Africa gave birth to the world. This is what the Egyptians were saying. That at the beginning of the Nile, where the God happy dwell, where Cyrus dwelt, this is where man was born. All the men on the earth, the Egyptians said black, brown, red, and yellow. White man is coming along a little late, so we can throw him in there later. But the four basic race, racial groups can go, can trace their ancestry all the way back to their Central Africa. Is that what Richard Leakey said? Is that what Donald Johansson said? Is that what the mitochondrial DNA studies are saying? All in coordination and conjunction. And what's the guy, uh, the, the guy that came with evolution? Isn't that what he was saying? Darwin? They all go back. You gotta, where are they getting these sciences from? The same people that write magic flutes and all these other things. They've been studying our papyruses and scrolls for years now. All of a sudden they got all these sciences, mathematics, geology. Geology came from the old science of mineralogy. Mineralogy came from alchemy. Alchemy comes from the word alchemic that the Arabs called Egypt when they conquered Egypt. Alchemic came from the Egyptian word kemet which meant the black land. Kemet, to alchemy, to chemistry, mineralogy, geology, all these sciences are going back to Kemet. Evolution. All that stuff goes back to Kemet. And we didn't know it. So the book says, and the river round of Eden, the water garden, and from this it was parted, and came into how many heads? For how many heads do you see the river coming into right here? So Moses is just writing, sitting here looking right at the papyrus, learning all the wisdom. James Henry, uh, 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 not James Henry Busted, but Willis Budge in his book, Osiris, the Egyptian Resurrection. The presence of the lily suggests water. And in the papyrus of Hunefa, the lily is seen to be growing out of a lake or stream. The figures of the four sons of Horus stand on the flower. This agrees with the old legend which sets the throne of Osiris close to or above the fountain of water which flows from where? Flows from heaven and is the source of the now upon the earth. The place where the four suns stand on the flower which represents the place where Osiris sits on the throne which is the source of the now upon the earth. The place where man was born is the place where man goes back to for judgment. So the book of Revelation and the book of Genesis talks about the river that flows out from the garden. There's only one river that flows out from the equator, from the belly, from the center, from the navel of the earth, and that is the Nile River. It cannot be represented up here. It can only be represented right here. So that's what the Hebrews knew, and that's why Moses had to be the first person, the Egyptian. Uganda, here. You got Tanzania, Kenya. This is dead central, so-called darkest, 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 darkest Africa. Black Africa, south of the Sahara, it all. This is where it is. Osiris is strong. From where? And tell me, that's where the Jews want their homeland, right here. That's why they picked that spot. They knew that was the center of the earth. That was the Yom Kippur. That was the place of atonement. That's another story, so we're going to keep going here. But anyway, point I'm making here, here's Israel right here. Here's where the river breaks up and in the Mediterranean. And men migrate all over the world from this particular point. Willie Mays could stand here, throw a baseball, hit somebody in the head in Israel. That's how close it is to, to Kemet or Egypt. 
So you mean these people are going to come out and map out a theological eschatology with everything that we had living right next door to the most powerful, the first organized United Nation in the world, 3,000 years B.C., 5,000 years ago was the first nation on the earth complete with religion, complete with mathematics, complete with science, complete with, with every aspect of the, of, the, of the Hebrew religion right there intact, and they're going to pretend like they didn't have no impact or influence on them from these people. Right next door. Somebody right in your backyard. The greatest nation in antiquity. 3,000 continuous years of rule in Egypt. The United States is only 200 years old. 3,000 continuous years. Right here, they, they, for 3,000 years, they, they, there's a highway going through here as Egyptians are colonizing this whole area, and they're going to sit there and act like somebody revealed something to them out of the clear blue. So the, the gates here symbolically represent Aset and Nebhet, the two mothers. Also the universal mountains of Manu and Baku. To go into this temple was to go into the womb. This was a great cathedral of learning in the beginning. And so to go in that cathedral is to go into the gate of heaven. The Egyptian temple was designed as the gate of heaven. To go inside that temple was to take a journey into darkest Africa. That's what that temple was modeled after. When I say architectonics, the Book of the Dead was designed right into that temple. Now you can see where the, the Europeans have copied the theme of the cathedral, the twin towers of the gates of heaven, Notre Dame, or Our Lady of, of uh, Chartres, Our Lady of, of Paris, Our Lady of uh, Lyon, Our Lady here of uh, Westminster Abbey, wherever you find an Our Lady, you find the same thing. The double tower was an Egyptian invention. Not only did they take the religion, they took the architecture as well. This is what we're going to show you now. The twin tower of the Egyptian temple became the twin tower of the cathedral and basilica throughout Europe. Philosophically, architecturally, theologically, practically identical. For all intents and purposes, identical. This area in the church they call the nave, the area in pink. Excuse me, the narthex. The narthex leads to the nave, which leads to the transept of crossing, which leads to the to the uh, to the uh, to the holy of holies, which we call in the temple, which is the uh, which is the altar place or the most sacred place or the apse in the church, as they call it the apse. Breaking this thing down. So to enter this area here was the entered in Arctic, what we call Bachnet, the gates of heaven. To go into the cathedral was to go into the gates of heaven in Kemet. So time and time again, we showed the double twin tower. Here you see the obelisk here, the symbol of resurrection, Osiris's penis, right in front of the temple. Now you know what George Washington wants to resurrect from the dead about, how he got this concept. What they did in some cases was just tear them off. They were usually two in front of the temple. They just tear the thing off and put it right in front of their twin towers. Symbolizing the same thing, resurrection from the dead. The minister teaching doesn't even know about the twin towers right over his head. His religion, his natural born religion, Christianity is our religion. Every aspect of it is our religion. It is our soul, it's our spirit, it's what we wrote about for over 3,000 years before the Europeans knew anything about it. What they've done is taken it and disguised it and turned it against us. We go on, we can see again the Twin Towers as we go into the first great cathedral in human history. The great temple of Amun and Karnak. As we go inside the cathedral, they had twin, they had two sets of towers in this temple. One, as you entered the main gate, and they had another set back here. I'll show you here now. The first set right here, the second set here. This part here represents the, great, the first great cathedral in human history. The first great cathedral in human history. I'm going to demonstrate this for you. To go into this part of the cathedral is called the nave here. That represents this part of the cathedral here in the, the Kemet Temple. To go in here is the nave. This is the nave in the cathedral. This is Notre Dame Cathedral again, okay? So see the columns here? That's going back into the, the dead central portions of the church. That's the nave. Remember that term, nave. This is the nave in our church, our cathedral. Now the roof is off of it now, but you can see the columns leading back. 
Look at the columns with the capitals on it. Look at the columns with the capitals on it going to the nave of the cathedral. Okay? See the lights here? The light? The cathedral here? Clear story lights. This is called clear story lights. Let's keep going. James Henry Breslin, the father of American Egyptology, designed the first school of Egyptology in America, University of Chicago. This is what he writes in his book, History of Egypt. These columns were higher than those arranged on both sides of the middle, thus producing the higher roof over the central aisle or nave, and lower roof over the side aisles, the difference in level being filled with graded stone windows and a clear story. Thus were produced the fundamental elements in basilica and cathedral architecture, which we owe to the Theban architects of Amenhotep III. Rustin is telling us that the first concept of basilica and cathedral architecture we owe to Amenhotep. Is there a little Amenhotep in here today? Amenhotep III. You did this, brother. One day you will understand that. This is your building right here. This one right here. So he said that the clear story lights to light the inside of the building. To move this from the boards, from the band to the Nile to here. When you look to the colonnade hall here, as I told you before in Karnak, you can see the columns in the middle higher, and the columns on both sides lower. The same idea, the same design, done by the Greeks later on to make the basilica. Again, when you look to the columns, you can see the columns in the middle, 21 meters high, to the top. Then we have columns lower. And up the roof, and they have windows here for the light to go through. The Greeks later on have the same idea. The big columns and the, and the big columns like this, and other columns like this, and that's called the basilica. The basilica, or the Byzantic church, Coptic church, up till now. But the idea is African one. But applied by the Greeks later on, took it and did the basilica. The basilica like church, the Greek word. But the origin was Egyptian. Was Professor African. Muhammad, uh, official guide of Egypt. You can see one proof, two proofs, hundreds of proofs saying that the Africans are the, 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 the pioneers of culture. And they, the Africans, they are the pioneers of knowledge and science. Before the others, about 1,500 years before Christ, since 3,000 years, and the Africans, the pioneers of culture and civilization, and the others applied the same idea, the same things, to have the modern civilization, the modern civilization in Europe, and a lot of developed countries based on the African civilization. Teach. Okay. Teach. Teach. Right. Based on and teach. That's This relationship uh, can be further explained by with the use of a computer. If we look and examine the Kemetic Temple, we'll see that the idea of the hypostyle hall, uh, which you have in the center, the columns that support the ceiling, which is raised above the lower side column. These columns at a lower elevation, these columns at a higher elevation. The difference between the two creates the opening here, which you see allows the light to penetrate in and to light up the interior of this particular area, which sometimes is referred to as the hypostyle or grand hall. Again, these light sources coming from both sides. What the Cathedral Basilica builders did 
basically was to remove the columns from the center. Once they remove the column from the center, from the center, you have, for all intents and purposes, what we call a basilica plan. Now, later, when the Gothic builders, after the Romans and the Greeks had copied this concept from the ancient Egyptians, the Gothic builders took this a step further and removed this particular portion, which was a flat roof. You know, there was no rainfall in Egypt, uh, uh, so in Europe there was a constant rainfall, so there was a need for what we call gable-type roofs. And so what they did essentially was remove this particular type of roof and to create the uh, roof that we're accustomed to seeing on the Gothic uh, cathedrals and basilicas. Hence, you know, you get the modern cathedral basilica. So, what was done was to remove uh, the flat roof, remove the two columns from the center, and they extended the height of the ceiling here, and uh, spanned across with what we call truss, a roof truss. And essentially, you have the same concept: the lower side aisles over a central nave or, or high area, which creates the light to allow the light to come in, the light the interior of the church, the cathedral, the basilica, etc. Where well, the ancient Egyptians were the founders of this particular concept, which was the most important feat that man had developed up until the Industrial Revolution. Right here. So he said that the clear story lights to light the inside of the building was designed by Amenhotep III. We go to St. Marie Marguerite. See the lights? Columns on the side, lights above. Columns on the side, the lights above. All it did was take the columns out of the center and put a truss on it out of wood. And this is what you get. The basilica and the cathedral. To go inside this gate, to go inside this gate, you get a clear story light. You get a clear story like they had a resurrection story we had a resurrection story they had four sons we had four sons we slayed a, 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 a python they slayed a python we had 42 commandments they had 10. we've been hoodwinked we've been had we've been bamboozled let's go back We flip over here. Y'all ready to go? Y'all want to see the rest of this? I just showed you how to copy a nave in the church. Everybody saw the nave, right? Right. So now this is the next part we have. We have the crossing or the transept. This is the most sacred part of the church. The transept on the cross. Again, this gets back to the cathedral. I said that when they go back to this particular part, this was the altar of the earth, the Bible in stone, the place where the river flowed out from Ethiopia. <coughs> altar comes from the Latin root altus, which means the high place. Okay? That's the place where the soul craft crosses over. This is the place where the, this is the intermediary boundary, the place that separates the world of the living from the world of the dead. Well, Cyrus said in judgment. Not activity. Get this. this is important that we uh, try to focus on this thing here. What about the word name? Where does name come from? Name means to navigate. Mm -hmm. The Latin root navis. To navigate. Navigate for what? What are you navigating for? Because you got to have water to navigate, right? So the ancient Egyptians said that you had to navigate, the soul had to navigate up the Nile River in a boat, which they call a bark, back to Osiris' land. So they call this place the nave here, it leads back to the high place, the high altar. Oh, wow. Here you can see Jesus. Here you can see Jesus. Everything okay, bro? 
he can see Jesus on a boat, symbolized by the cross, as they're navigating back to the cathedral, back to the throne. Okay? You go back to navigate back to the throne. That means this axis here represents the river in the book of Revelation. This represents the throne. Where Jesus sits at the throne for the judgment, determining where the underworld was St. Peter's has been. This is a, this is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. St. Peter's is buried beneath this thing, beneath this altar. The four sons of, 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 of Jesus, the, the, the evangelical four, all appear on the four corners. You can only see one Matthew here. All the way around here. That represents the heaven. This represents the underworld. This represents the overworld. So by water, they come back to the nave, navigate back to the throne the altar of the earth with St. Peter who has the key to heaven. Right? Is that right? St. Peter's has the key. The jackal head of Anubis had the key of life, the arm. Horus had the key of life, the arm. The arm determined whether someone went, the key of life went to heaven or went to hell. You see where St. Peter gets his key from? He's buried in the underworld. Because he holds the key to the underworld. And those who are found unjust will remain in the underworld. This is Brother Rashid Ujima, a brother who went to the ancestors to die of the AIDS virus through a blood transfusion. He has done what the ancient Egyptians said we all would do. Someday our souls will return to the now, the place where all men were born, and our souls will return and journey up the Nile River to the beginning. To Mount Kenya, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Ruanzori, to the very beginning of the earth where our souls will be judged to determine whether or not we go to the heavens above or the lake of fire below. This was a whole religion mapped out this way. So they showed the bark or the boat. As they show the boat here, the soul on the boat, the symbol of the south, the white crown of the south, where the soul is journeying back to the primeval hill of the beginning, where Shu holds up the vault of heaven at the center of the earth. You see, Nuke, the sky goddess, that's why I said the woman was first. They showed the woman as heaven giving birth to the stars. Where Shu is holding up the, the woman at the two pillars of heaven, which is, her, which is uh, the breast and the, phall phall and the phallic region. That's the two pillars of heaven. The womb. So the boat is traveling in the womb of the mother, the cathedral, the basilica, traveling back to the beginning to be judged. That's Our Lady, the throne of Our Lady. This is the throne, the mountains. This is the place where heaven and earth meet. This is the place where heaven and earth meet, where Shu is standing on Geb, the earth, and heaven and earth are coming together at this place where the soul is coming back to. The sky above and the earth, the underworld and the overworld are coming together. The volcanoes in the interior of earth, this is a volcano, Kilimanjaro. The fire from underneath can rise up above the heavens. Osiris is the judge of the underworld and determines who goes to heaven. The altar of the earth. That's why they built this thing in the great temple of Amun at Karnak, a pet I said. Because that pedestal, which they call Hetep, Heru, Set, Waret, represent the primeval hill of the beginning. That represents the place where man was born. That represents the place where the souls would travel back to. It was symbolism to symbolize the mountains of the moon. These mountains in the interior of the heartland of Africa. The whole Egyptian temple was designed around that theme. So you find the basilica, uh, and cathedral represent the same thing. We go and we see the sand represents the primeval hill which the Egyptians often depicted as a flight of stairs leading to the center and summit of heaven. If Atam or Ra shone from, from the summit of the hill, so did Osiris, so did Osiris. Osiris sits in judgment in a palace in the primeval mound which is the center of the world, Clark writes Clark. So Osiris is sitting right at the primeval hill symbolized by the steps Symbolized by the pyramids, everything you see as Egyptians represented as rising up represented the primeval hill of the beginning. As you see Atom and Osiris, Atom, as you see Osiris, Atom, Ra, and Osiris back to back here at the primeval hill of the beginning where they sit in judgment. What is Atom, brothers, sisters? 
What does it represent? Fire, right? Helio, helium, sun, fire. We go to Atom, fire, the primeval hill. You saw Geb holding up the earth where the underworld and the overworld come together. You see the volcano erupting while Tom of fire sets on the hill. Osiris is green because he represents the earth. His, guess who's a fa who, who Osiris' father is? Osiris' father is Geb, the one who was holding up the ball of heaven, the two pillars. That's Osiris' father. So he assumes the role of his father as Geb and green. A time is fire, so the fire and the earth are coming together here at the underworld. I said this was the first chemistry chart. The first chemistry chart. So the pyramid was a model of this. Pyra means fire, mid is mound, the mound or mountain of fire. That's what a pyramid is designed after this. The primeval hill of the beginning where Osiris sets in judgment at the throne of God. Right here. That's what those pyramids represent way down here in Egypt. The mountains around the lake of fire here in the dead central portions of Africa. Frankfurt, kingship and the gods. The identity of the temple with the primeval hill mounts to a sharing of essential quality. It's expressed in their names and in their architectural arrangements by means of ramps or steps. Each temple rose from its entrance through its successive courts and halls to the Holy of Holies, which was thus situated at a point noticeably higher than the entrance. There the statue barge of Phoenix of the God was kept resting upon the primeval hill. Okay, so the primeval hill, the temple itself, they stepped the temple up, they stepped the ceiling down because that represented the place where everything came together. At the beginning, the center of the earth, the place of sunrise and creation. That's what the ancient Egyptians wrote. And so the whole temple itself, as you see the temple here, to go inside the two pylons, botnet, the gates, the womb, was to go inside the temple, was to go down the Nile River to, by boat, by water. The boat would take you down the axis of the temple to the primeval hill of the beginning, which is in the center of the earth. I just demonstrated where Africa is in the center. And the Nile River is flowing out from the center. That's where the boat, the bark was set on the center, the high place, the head tip heru set were rep represent the center of the earth. That's what it was about. The whole story, the whole temple. Everything was about that. So when the Europeans set this canopy up, all they did was took the boat out from under it and made it larger, but it represented the same thing, the place where the God took his stand at the center of the earth. This little canopy right here, they set the image of the netter, Horus, in this temple, Temple of Horus, was set right in here because that's the place where he took his stand at the center of the earth where the boat would travel back and terminate at the point of culmination at the beginning of the Nile River. So this is why they call us the nave, and this is where the high altar, you see Jesus sitting right here at the throne at the beginning. Here you see the boat stepping the temple up, stepping the ceiling down. The boat comes to rest at the beginning of the earth. comes to rest at the beginning of the earth, the rising up the high place, the altar of the earth. The crossing, where the soul crosses over from this world to the next, at the equator. And his penis out front for resurrection. Going back to the primeval hill of the beginning, through the nave, copy the architecture, copy the religion, Osiris sits under his throne. They come and the Pope sits under his, under his throne. They kiss his feet while the Pope is wearing Osiris' hat with his four sons right around him. And the Pope has the four sons right on his hat, as I showed you earlier. This is the canopy. This is where they're getting it from. This canopy right here represents the altar of the earth. Where Osiris sat at the altar of the earth. Subsoil water as well as the Nile flood would start to flow out from noon since the primeval hill was a place of sunrise and creation and hence the place of rebirth and resurrection. The waters of noon which surrounded it became those waters of death which in the imagination of many people separate the world of the living from the world of the dead. That's the place where the Nile boat would take them back to the beginning. The whole temple was about that. They even built boats next to the pyramids 
to symbolically take their souls back along the banks of the Nile back to the interior of Africa. Navigating back to the beginning of the world. Sanctuary. Is that, what the, is that what we call it? The name? The sanctuary. You go to church, we go into the sanctuary. That's what the ministers call it, right? So Isis took sanctuary in the papyrus plants to give birth to Horus because the evil said Typhon wanted to kill her holy child born by the virgin birth. So she saw a sanctuary in the papyrus plants. She saw a sanctuary in the papyrus plants. So here you can see Mary taking sanctuary in the lilies. This is the temple. Taking sanctuary. See that? Jesus on her lap. Horus on her lap. And Jesus on her lap. Only thing you got a blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus and Mary with the lilies all around them. Moses was found in the basket in the lilies. Jesus in the lilies. Horus in the lilies. Taking sanctuary from the. They said the Pharaoh wanted to kill him. He's taking sanctuary. Here's the sanctuary. See the lilies? You see it now? That's the sanctuary. That's where Isis goes to give birth, the birthing chamber, the birth house. To take sanctuary. So you see the whole thing is done in stone. White folks don't have no reason. They can't explain these columns in here. They have no geological, geographical, or topographical explanation for these columns. These columns go back to the papyrus plants of Isis that Moses had, that Jesus had goes back to Africa, to the Nile Valley. That's the sanctuary, with the lights above to light the temple, the cathedral. See the lights here? See those lights? See these lights here? Just copied it. So here you are, Mary and Jesus. We get ready to wrap this thing up. Holding the lily in her hand, where she's usurped Isis tradition. She became the queen of, 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 of France, the queen of heaven. House of Isis, par S, house of Isis, Paris. Literally means the house of Isis. Here's the throne. This is Isis, her symbol, the golden one, Isis. The throne, that's her symbol. Cathedral, look, cathedral, the church of the, bis bi the bishop containing what? Cathedral means throne. Getting back to it again. Our Lady, Our Lady, Notre Dame, Our Lady, the cathedral, the throne of Isis, of Isis, Parsa. Notre Dame, de, the cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris, the throne of Our Lady at Paris, the throne of Our Lady, the house of Isis. Here's the throne of Our Lady, as she sits on the throne, Jesus, is the, Jesus sits on the throne of his mother Isis, or Mary, showing you the winged sun disk, her feet at the winged sun disk. Whole thing is about the sun. Whole thing is about the sun traveling through the procession. Now you might have seen Joseph Campbell on his uh, various programs on mythology, where he's writing in his book, and Moyers is interviewing him, uh, Bill Moyers is inter interviewing Joseph Campbell. Bo Moyers asked Campbell, if we go back into antiquity, do we find images of the Madonna as the mother of the, of the Savior child? Joseph Campbell, right, right on KCT, wrote or, or spoke, the antique model for the Madonna actually is Isis with Horus on her breast. That's what he said. He goes on. Um, uh, in Egyptian iconography, Isis represents the throne. The Pharaoh sits on the throne, which is Isis, as the child sits on his mother's lap. And so when you stand before the Cathedral of Shards, you will see over one of the portals of the western front an image of the Madonna as the throne upon which the child Jesus sits and blesses the world as its emperor. That is precisely the image that has come down to us from most ancient Egypt. The early fathers and early artists took over these images intentionally. Moyer says, the Christian fathers took over the image of Isis? Campbell says, definitely. They say so themselves. Read the text where it is declared that those forms, which were merely mythological forms in the past, are now actual and incarnate in our Savior. 
So maybe if you won't believe Brother Matthew, maybe you believe the white man, uh, Joseph Campbell. So the Cathedral of Notre Dame was just the throne of the womb of the mother, and this is to make a journey back into the womb, to make a journey down the Nile Valley, right back in the dark, darkest, deepest Africa. That's what that represents. And all our lives, we've been under the doctrines of Christianity, and no one has ever told us that. Just copy the columns, the pylons. Notre Dame, here's Notre Dame at Paris. This is the Temple of Isis in Egypt. This is the Temple of Isis in Paris. At this site, in the same exact location, in Roman times, there was a temple dedicated to Isis in the same spot that they built this cathedral. So here's the Temple of Isis right here on the island of Philae. Okay, let's move on. Here's the Cathedral of Isis, or Paris, Notre Dame. Notice the, the pylons, and notice the uh, clear story lights. I said that this is the first time this was done. The pylons, the clear story lights, all it did was put these little flying buttresses right here to increase the height. Just copied this architecture. Who told you that, that, that we had cathedrals in ancient Africa? A brother from South Central told you. Went to an art history class and history of architecture class and all those classes. Didn't get it, a brother from South Central. Crips, Bloods, Brims, Pyrus, family, struggling out there trying to stay alive in the streets, talking that talk, walking that walk. Here I come walking in here with this. The Temple of Isis on the island of Philae, the temple of Isis on the island in France. Not only did they take the architecture, put it on the island. In this spot, an exact spot, at one time there was a temple devoted to Isis in Roman times right underneath the, te right underneath the cathedral. They, one of the things that the, uh, the ancient Egyptians did was they put stones from earlier temples under the new temples as they built them because they saw that life was continuous. They didn't believe in death. So even when they built a temple, they took the old temple stones to make the foundation for the new temples. Fortunate for us, some of these stones have been turned up in Europe. We go on, we can see the Freemasons have taken the same concepts of foundation ceremonies, taking earlier stones and placing them under new buildings. In Roman times, during the, during the Greek and Roman times, the Ptolemies were using temple, uh, stones from early Egyptian temples to put on the Temple of Horus at Edfu. We found these temples here laying right underneath the, the foundation. You can see earlier temple uh, stones right here all over the place here. Well, this stone here was found under the most sacred place of Notre Dame Cathedral of Apse, the symbol of Vulcan. Vulcan is where we get the word volcano from, right? I said that the altar of the earth represented the place where the volcanoes meet the heavens, right? In the Egyptian temple. Here in the apse of Notre Dame, they had a stone buried underneath the foundation of the Roman god Vulcan. Also a tablet dedicated to Isis, where you found the cranes and you also found the bull of Serapis and the cranes of Isis underneath the same foundation. You had Vulcan, who was Ptah. I said in the beginning, Ptah's temples were destroyed in the north. Ptah was a Vulcan, was a volcano god, the primeval hill god. So Vulcan and Ptah are the same god, the primeval hill god. And Isis, tablets are, stand, are sitting right next to Vulcan. The same concepts right there in the temples and churches. Is everybody with me? One of the stones bears an inscription. This is the stones they found in Notre Dame. Bears an inscription that it was dedicated in the reign of the Emperor Tiberius in 14 to 37 by the ship owners of Paris. It is interesting to note that 70 odd years after Caesar's conquest, uh, they, uh, uh, these wealthy uh, native guildsmen probably ignored the Roman name of Lititia and, re and, and referred to themselves as Nate Par Isaaci. The Nate is a nautical house of Isis, the Isaacs, look in any book on Egypt in Roman time, you find the Isaacs are the worshippers of Isis. 
So the house of Isis, the nautical house of Isis, was written on that tablet underneath the foundation of Notre Dame Cathedral, where Notre Dame gets his, where Paris gets his name, the house of Isis, right from Isis. Guess what? <laughs> Guess who Isis is? <laughs> <laughs> Who gave that to, to America? Huh? France, right? Paris, France sent this over to the United States as a beacon of light. You know what ISIS name was? The Star of the Sea. That's what ISIS, they called ISIS in Roman times. The, ISIS, the, the Romans loved ISIS. They worshipped her. And during the, nav the navigation period, the Romans had a ceremony which they called the Navigium Asutus, which is the launching of the ships of ISIS which took place every March the 5th. They wouldn't even begin to navigating until they paid homage to ISIS. So here's George Washington. Even when you see the boats with the woman on it, that goes back to ISIS, the queen of the sea. So here's George behind a mason, behind ISIS, in a boat. Look at the star here. I said the star of the sea. That was ISIS' title. Holding up in fact, this, this base was designed in Egyptian, was an Egyptian design. This base was designed in Egyptian. She's holding up the light, the fire, the flame of heaven coming from Egypt. You see the Roman Isis holding up the system. This is the Roman Isis. Statue of Liberty is modeled after the Roman Isis. The Roman Isis, and what's it sitting on? It's on an island, right? Islands are sacred to Isis. Notre Dame, the Temple of Isis, our own islands. We've been had. We've been hoodwinked. <laughs> well, Malcolm had it right. That brother, I love Malcolm. Malcolm is the reason I'm here today. I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for Malcolm. 16 years old, brother confused, flunking school and kept back in the third grade, stayed back in the seventh. Eighth grade picked up Malcolm. Some of the eighth grade, eighth going to ninth grade, picked up Malcolm, read Malcolm. By the time I left Crenshaw High School, he had a 3.4, almost a 3.5 GPA, and had flunked two grades before that because of Malcolm. Because I saw a man who read by the crack of the door and almost went blind reading at the door when they turned the prison lights out on him. Hence, it was more likely that the captain of how Thor is a district of Punt. Further of Isis, who was identified at Dendera with Hathor, it is said Isis was born in the ism of Dendera of Ap, one of the, uh, the great one of the temple of Ap, under the form of a woman, black and red. This points to a southern origin. Now this is the, uh, Flinders Petrie, who dug up more than any other Egyptologist in the history of Egypt, and he says that Egypt was a, Isis was a black woman born in the south, and this points to a southern origin for Isis. He didn't have no choice. So this is why you see the images of Mary and Jesus right up to the 12th century were all uniformly shown as being black. Because Mary and Jesus were Isis and Horus. So because they were black and the Romans worshipped them, Mary and Jesus from the beginning were black. Because that's who they were worshipping, Isis. And she was black. And just like we see now, you see all the, all the what knocks on the shelves and chains around their necks, and everybody got a Jesus fish on the back of their car. Back in Kemet, Egypt, everybody had a what knock on the shelf, a symbol, a sign of the resurrected Savior Horus, seated on his mother's lap. So the Madonna, or the Madonna of uh, Jesus and Mary comes directly from Isis and Horus, headed all over the place. Matthew, second chapter and was there, talking about Jesus, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Jerusalem have I called my son. You know Jerusalem? Where did this Egypt come from, brother? Out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Out of Egypt have I called my son. It's all sign language. It's all mysteries. So when he came out, he came out black. Carrying him through the streets of Poland. White folks carrying a black Madonna and Jesus Christ through the streets of Poland. 
in Russia, the, Ethiop the Ethiopian, hair, everything, the black virgin, the most sacred icons of Europe, kept in the cavities in the chambers of the cathedrals and basilicas throughout Europe. Spain, Portugal. Man said, one of the priests was trying to explain the story, he says, well, those images, never mind those images because they're black because one day we were having a ceremony in the church and the candles fell over and blackened the image. Godfrey Higgins in his book, Anacalypse, said, well, that was a hell of an artistic storm because it blackened the face and left the eyes white and left the red tinge on the lips. It went from cathedral, cathedral to cathedral, painting other pictures. Didn't stop, just kept on going. Hell of a storm. You can see the see, you can even see the natural on the brother on this one. You got to get So with Michelangelo, 500th anniversary of the lie, anniversary of Michelangelo, who began to paint the white Madonnas and sculpture the white Madonnas that we have today. He sculpted his own family when he made these images. So like Dr. King he said, one day we all returned to that mountaintop. He said he saw the promised land and wasn't fearing any man. His eyes had seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Osiris has gone back to Ethiopia. His boat has rid, ro, drip, driven itself down the Nile River, and now he stands erect, ready to accept the eternal life that is waiting for him in Osiris' realm and Jesus' realm. And so I just thank all of you for being here tonight to listen to this particular lecture, the Egyptian Temple Mother of the Christian Church. Thank you very much.